uh, delighted to um, be joining you, albeit remotely. Um, I think this is one of the examples of some of the wonderful things, wonderful possibilities that technology provides um, by allowing us to connect uh, at times when it's physically not safe or possible. And so, uh, and so I'm really delighted uh, to be here with you. Um, and I understand there's a bunch of you from all over the place, so, so welcome to everyone. Um, as, uh, as Adam mentioned, I'll be speaking on basically some, an outline of some topics that come from the book, Shaping a Digital World. But I thought I would start with, uh, with a little bit about me, um, just so that you know where I'm coming from. And I suspect that my story is not much different than many of yours. Um, I grew up uh, perhaps a little earlier uh, than, than some of you, but I, I grew up in the 1980s. And the 1980s were an exciting time. It was the beginning of the personal computer revolution. And I saved up my paper route money and bought a Timex Sinclair ZX81, which was able to put the power within my reach uh, for $99.95. And it came with a one kilobyte of memory, a membrane keyboard, you connected it to your TV, put it on channel three to, for a monitor, and you saved and recorded your programs to an audio cassette tape. Uh, and then if you were so inclined, you could expand it to 16K for an additional 59.95. So that was my first computer, and, um, and I fell in love with it. Um, I loved computing, I loved the possibilities um, I loved the world that it opened up, and, uh, and, and I think it was a lot of that early work as an enthusiast and as a hobbyist that, that got me on the current career track that I'm on to uh, now. And uh, the, the other picture here is, is a little bit of a uh, picture of me when I was uh, much younger, again, as a teenager, um, working on ham radio. So another, another area that, that piqued my interest was electronics. I got into ham radio and thankfully I didn't electrocute myself or anything, but I, I, um, I tinkered with, uh, with radios and electronics and I just loved the whole world of computers and electronics. And, uh, and later on after high school went on to study engineering, as Adam mentioned, and then worked in industry. And, and basically when I began working in industry, uh, this is where uh, I began to, uh, ask questions about, you know, what is the connection between my work as a programmer and an engineer and the Christian faith? I, uh, I, I think when I was younger, uh, these sort of questions didn't really occur to me. I, I loved technology and I love Jesus. And, um, and I didn't really see the need to connect those dots. Um, and uh, as I grew older and after I had spent some time uh, sitting in a cubicle farm and beginning to, to think about the wider sort of perspective of my life and what I was doing, uh, it began to become more important to me that I could connect those dots. What does my faith have to do with my, with my work as an engineer? Um, I was raised in a Christian family. I was raised in the church and I loved Jesus and I, I wanted to follow him. And I knew that he was Lord of all but it, 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 it didn't really compute, uh, so to speak, with me, how faith could inform my work as an engineer. Perhaps, you know, um, witnessing in the lunchroom, uh, you know, over lunch break, um, you know, not stealing and these sorts of things were, were sort of obvious ways to think about, you know, how you exercise your faith in, in the workplace. But my work itself, um, what, what sort of uh, way could I, could, could I see the context of my work within, within my, my faith, which, uh, um, which was something that I, I hadn't been taught at school and something that I had to work out. And, uh, and of course, I was not um, the first to ask these sorts of questions. Christians throughout the ages have been asking the questions about how we relate to culture uh, Tertullian, who was an early church father, asked the question already early on, you know, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Um, and this is, this is very early on in early church history. And what he meant by that is Athens 
uh, represented the city of culture. And Jerusalem, of course, was, was a symbol of faith. And so the question was, what does culture have to do with faith? What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? What is, you know, if we want to update that question, we could ask, what does Silicon Valley have to do with Jerusalem? What do bites have to do with beliefs? And these are questions that Christians have wrestled with over the millennia and uh, have come to different conclusions, quite frankly. But I, I think that this is that all thoughtful Christians, you know, working in industry and in the public square and, and en en engaged in all kinds of different activities need to be thinking about how does my faith inform my work? How do I integrate my faith with my career and with my work, with my calling? Um, and so th th this question is not new. And I think one way to begin to answer this question is to start sort of with more philosophical questions about, you know, what is technology and, 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 and what is its nature? And I think one of the first things that, that, that you learn about when you begin to study the philosophy of technology and you begin to consider it uh, is that it changes things. And, you know, that sounds somewhat obvious, but, um, but consider the automobile, for instance. Um, the automobile is not a neutral uh, tool. It's not a, a neutral invention. It isn't just a way of getting from point A to point B. The automobile fundamentally shapes and changes our lives. Um, the automobile shapes our cities. Our cities are laid out according to roads and highways. Um, the automobile shapes uh, the architecture of our homes. Um, if you go back a hundred years, one of the most defining features in the front of homes was a front porch or veranda. If you look now, it's, it's a large garage. Um, and because of that, we, we don't quite know our neighbors as well as we used to. Where we live and where we work and where we worship uh, can often be separated by large distances uh, because of the automobile. The sense of neighborhood and community is very different than it was. Um, in fact, the, the, the modern mega church is only possible because of the automobile and, well, the microphone and other technologies like it. Um, and of course, uh, if you think about the smartphone, portable digital communications technologies, uh, they have also fundamentally changed things. They, um, they're not just new ways to communicate, but they've, they've changed the way that we live, the way that we relate, uh, the way that we um, view the world. Um, the, the changes are more fundamental um, than just a functional addition. Um, Neil Postman, who was an early media ecologist, used to say that technology is not additive, you know. Uh, after you introduce the smartphone, you don't have the same world plus a smartphone, you have a whole new world. It's like putting a little drop of red dye inside of a, um, a glass of water. You no longer have, um, you know, water in a, you don't have water in a, in a drop of dye, you have a whole new substance. And, uh, and so technologies are ecological, they change things. Um, they have moral ethical implications that we need to appreciate. And of course, if you look at the current literature um, and, and, and examine uh, what people are discovering about modern digital electronics, you'll find that the implications about how these are being used are profound. Um, uh, and even among non-Christians and others, um, it's, it's clear that technology is changing things, that technology has a profound uh, impact on our society and the way we think and the way we relate. Um, the book that's displayed here on my slide um, from left to right, uh, Nicholas Carr, The Shallows, he wrote this article originally in Atlantic Magazine, you know, is Google making us stupid? You know, there's this quote in there where he, he observes of himself. He says, I used to be an undersea diver in a world of words, and now I'm a jet ski guy skimming across the surface. Basically, Nicholas Carr is looking at how modern digital technology and the web has changed his reading habits. And by changing his reading habits, how it's changed the way that he thinks and the way that he takes information in. The book I bring similarly looks at the effect of digital media on our brains. And it turns out that brain plasticity uh, allows our brains to actually change in shape over time, uh, even when we're older. 
And uh, the neuroscientists who wrote this book uh, did some studies on how the, the, the brain actually physically changes uh, with response to digital stimuli. And, uh, and, and the, the authors go on to observe how modern digital technology can plunge us into a state of continuous partial attention if we allow it. Um, and, and through fMRI studies and brain scans, they've actually detected changes in the way that our brains um, uh, function. And uh, Sherry Turkle, alone together, she wrote a more recent book on, um, on communication. And, uh, but her book, Alone Together, I think, is, is a wonderful exploration of social media, social robotics, the subtitle of the book is Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other. And Sherry Turkle um, is an MIT social scientist who was there near the beginning of the personal computer revolution. And she, um, in these books that she's written, The Second Self, Alone Together, uh, and then her, her most recent one on communication, um, I think is discovered and beginning to unpack and explore some of the perhaps unintended side effects of some of our technologies. Weapons of Math Destruction, the fourth book pictured here, is, uh, is authored by Kathy O'Neill, who's one of the pioneers in data science. The subtitle is How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. If you've never heard Kathy O'Neill, I, I highly recommend that you, you look her up and, and look at some of her talks uh, and, and read her book. If you're in the world of big data and data science, I would say that... Uh, Weapons of Math Destruction is a must read. Uh, I think that she does a good job of showing how even algorithms are not neutral. So technology is not neutral, but even algorithms which at first blush seem to be mathematical, cold, hard calculating you know, equations, uh, um, uh, these things too are not, are not neutral. Um, she talks about the application of big data and algorithms in areas like um, um, hiring decisions made by companies and how when you train uh, for machine learning algorithms that these, that these algorithms pick up on existing biases that are already in the training data. And so if, if a company wants to hire more employees and it bases its training set on an existing uh, set of employees, that if they have in the past not hired many women or minorities, that that um, bias will be encoded uh, in the algorithm and will be perpetuated going forward. And she looks at uh, how, this, how this carries out in uh, bank loans in uh, determining whether or not people can get parole from jails and how all of this data um, is often perpetuating injustice um, and that these algorithms are not just a cold, you know, mathematical, factual um, implementations, but rather they encode uh, opinions and bias that are already there. And of course, um, if you've looked recently at um, books on automation, there's, there's a fear about how AI and how modern automation technologies are beginning to displace many, many jobs. Of course, technologies always displace jobs, but, uh, but it seems that the pace is accelerating. So technology is not neutral, it's profoundly changing us. And as computer scientists and engineers, we have a profound responsibility uh, in our work um, in terms of uh, justice and loving our neighbor. Um, and so I think thinking about technology and faith, we need to start with um, the understanding that technology is value laden, that it's not neutral. And this goes back to people like Neil Postman and Jacques Wall and, these were writers decades ago who, uh, who made the observation that technology has a bias. Um, this quote from Neil Postman, a predisposition to construct the world as one thing rather than another, to value one thing over another, to amplify one sense or skill or attitude more loudly than another. And uh, in this quote from John Culkin, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. And that's the same with our, our digital tools. So, so this means that our work as computer scientists and engineers have, has a profound implications uh, for the world, for our neighbors. And so as Christians, we need to, we need to take that seriously. And uh, 
And so the question as Christians, of course, is, well, then how shall we compute? Uh, you know, how shall we live as computer scientists and engineers? Um, and of course, our guide for holy living as, as Christians has always been the scriptures. It's been the Bible. Um, what, what does the Bible have to say about our work with computer technology? And that's not an easy question. Unfortunately, we can't, you know, pull a Bible dictionary off the shelf and, uh, and look up computer and then pull all the proof texts out and then, uh, you know, and then proceed from there. Um, the ancient scriptures, um, what do they have to say about modern computer technology? Um, and I think there's lots of ways to try to integrate faith with the scriptures um, that maybe don't do justice to the scriptures or perhaps force read things into them that we ought not to. We need to take the Bible uh, at its, um, for, for what it is, you know, a trustworthy story of God's salvation uh, narrative. And within that story, we need to understand what our calling and what our role is as engineers and computer scientists. And I think one helpful way to think about our work in technology is to look at the whole sweep of the biblical story. So rather than you know, trying to pick through and look for proof texts uh, here and there, to look at the whole biblical story, the, the biblical narrative. The biblical story is, is, is this story within which all of our personal stories are nested. Uh, the biblical narrative is the grand story of God's salvation plan that is the true story of the whole world. And by looking at that story and looking at our context uh, within that story and our calling within that story, I think we can get a better understanding about how to live out our lives faithfully in all kinds of different areas, including our work with technology. Now, one way to get a handle on this biblical story is to think about the themes that, 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 uh, that you encounter as you read from Genesis to Revelation. And if you look at the biblical story, um, you, you can detect the theme of creation, the beginning, how everything begins. Um, then there's the theme of the fall and how things have gone wrong. There's the theme of redemption, the coming of Jesus Christ, which is promised throughout the Old Testament. And then the, the image of restoration of the new heavens and the new earth. And it's this story, I think, that gives us a context and a way of thinking about our work. So what I'm gonna do right now is just go through each of these biblical themes, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, and just briefly talk about some of the implications for our work in the world of technology. So let's start with creation. So what does the world, what does the story of creation have to tell us about our work with technology? Well, here's a, here's a few things. First, computer technology is part of the latent potential in creation. Um, I think that often when we look at creation or we think about creation, we think about you know, birds and bees and trees and stars and, and, and so on. Um, but creation is everything that God has ordained to be. All of the laws and possibilities in creation, including the possibilities for technology. So I think when we think about creation, we have to think about creation you know, the big picture of all of the possibilities uh, that God placed in, in the world already right from the beginning. And I think uh, near the beginning of the story, we read about how God puts um, the human couple in, in, in the garden and gives them a job, gives uh, what's, what's often referred to as the cultural mandate. Um, and that mandate includes filling the world. Um, and that filling is not just, you know, having lots of babies, that, that filling actually means um, uh, unfolding all of the, the, the possibilities in creation, um, discovering, you know, all of the cultural possibilities, uh, exploring art and music and cuisine and, and architecture and technology, all of these things, um, are basically um, pregnant at the beginning of, uh, of creation. There's all these possibilities that are there that are latent and, and God gives the human family um, the call to, to responsibly unfold that. We also learn in the creation story that God created humans in his image. And so I think this has profound implications when we think about the differences between people and machines, when we think about artificial intelligence and artificial persons. 
when we think about <clears throat> you know the difference between um, humans and and uh, and machinery, um, I think that you know that 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 doctrine in creation helps guide us as we think about what's distinctive about about being human. Um, Fourthly, creation is complex and diverse. Um, we see that God creates us this, this very complex creation in which everything is made, each according to its kind. Um, and so we need to avoid any kind of reductionism, um, th this idea that we can boil all of creation down to just the random interaction of particles, for instance. We, we need, God made all of these possibilities, uh, rich and diverse possibilities in creation. And we need to respect those. Um, I think in the creation story, God also establishes a pattern of Sabbath rest. And I think this pattern of Sabbath rest is becoming, um, <clears throat> well, is built into the fabric of creation. It's something that we need to, to, to rediscover, especially in a world that's on 24-7 and where sometimes we, our machines and our tools never rest. And consequently, we don't always get the rest we should either. Um, and so I think this notion of Sabbath and the practices of, of rest and work, the rhythm of rest and work, is something that we see already laid out at the very beginning of creation is something that we need to appreciate even in our modern world. And of course, creation has laws, it has limits, and it has norms. These are things where God has said, thus far you shall go and no further. Uh, this is parts of creation where God has established things to work in a, in a in a predictable, um, orderly way. And, and by making and discovering these things, we were able to make technology. Um, but that technology is not just uh, uh, law-based, there's also norms. And so I'll, I'll, I'll discuss some of those a little bit later. So, so just very briefly, these are some of the implications of the creation story for our work in technology. And I thought I'd share with you this, this very quick quote, quote, which has to do with, with um, reflecting the image of God. Frederick P. Brooks is perhaps one of the more famous living computer scientists. Uh, he wrote the book, The Mythical Man Month, which a lot of computer scientists read, um, and The Design of Design more recently. He was the architect of the OS 360 in the 1960s at IBM. A uh, highly respected computer scientist who's also a Bible believing Christian. And I'll, I'll share this, this quote from the Mythical Man Month. <clears throat> um, Fred Brooks writes Why is programming fun? What delights may its practitioners expect as his reward? First is the sheer joy of making things, as the child delights in his mud pie, so the adult enjoys making things, especially things of his own design. I think this delight must be an image of God's delight in making things, the delight shown in the distinctiveness and newness of each leaf, and each snowflake. I think that's wonderful. And I think every programmer, every coder knows a bit about this, the delight of making something new, right? Building castles in the air, building beautiful websites, beautiful algorithms, beautiful pieces of code that do delightful things. I, I think everyone's experienced this delight. Um, and, uh, and I think part of what drives us as computer scientists and engineer, engineers is that delight in making things. Now, unfortunately, um, uh, near the beginning, um, the creation fell under a curse. And so um, that's referred to as the fall. And, <clears throat> and that brought thorns and thistles into, uh, into work. And of course, anyone who's programmed also knows the experience of uh, encountering things that don't work the way they're supposed to, um, of work that's hard, um, of work that can be frustrating at times. Uh, Romans 8 verse 22, when it talks about the, the fall, talks about um, uh, something that has implications for all of creation. The whole creation has been groaning, it says in Romans 8. And, and so this has also impacted technology. It's impacted human relationships. It's impacted our relationship with God. It's impacted our relationship with creation, with our work. Um, and of course, technology as part of culture and part of work has also been impacted by sin. And we can name all kinds of ways that technology is misdirected um, and how technology is used in ways that are sinful, ways that are disobedient. 
C.S. Lewis, I think, um, in this quote here, gives a sense of how comprehensive the fall into sin was. Uh, he writes, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. This, the, 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 the effect of sin is comprehensive. And so we see that in our technical work. And we, we see that working out in all kinds of different ways in our lives. Um, the fall is, is not just a personal uh, moral failing. It's, it's a comprehensive creational thing. Um, but what's interesting, I think, to, to, to realize is that the goodness of creation persists. And, and sin is like a parasite that attaches itself to God's good creation. And, um, and, and so I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, and so to see technology as, as, as good, part of the good possibilities in creation, but something that can be misdirected and perverted. Um, this may sound a little bit strange, but um, um, something like internet pornography is only possible because of God's good creation, right? I mean, God created sexuality. God created the possibility for bits to shoot down wires the ability to project images on displays. Um, those are all creational possibilities. But internet pornography is perverting, distorting, uh, all of those creational possibilities in disobedient ways, in ways that God never intended us to do. And so we need to see sin as a, 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 like a parasite that infects our work, that infects technology, and... Um, and, and, and be conscious of the different ways that technology can be perverted and, and misdirected. And of course, it, it's not just the technology that gets misdirected, but also our hearts. So here's a little image that I, I clipped from a, a website on a book called Infinite Progress. And it has the subtitle, How the Internet and Technology Will End Ignorance, Disease, Poverty, Hunger, War. Um, these are almost, this is almost biblical language. Um, this is what one might call technicism, you know, a trust in technology, putting your faith and hope in technology. Now, it's true that technology is a blessing, that it can help push back, you know, some of the effects of the fall. Um, and we, we can be thankful for medical technology and for all kinds of things that, um, that we're blessed with. But to look to technology as the thing that will end all of these things uh, puts technology in God's place. It, it, uh, it, it's a kind of post-millennial hope that technology will usher in a utopia. And of course, technology is also affected by the fall. And, uh, and so this is... Um, misplacing our trust and our faith in technology. And of course, there's some who even believe that one day we will um, solve the problem of death, that eventually uh, we'll be able to download our brains into a computer and live forever. And, and there's a lot of clever people who, uh, who believe this and are pursuing research along these lines, people like Ray Kurzweil uh, and others. Um, and I think, you know, again, that's looking to technology for our salvation uh, instead of to Jesus. And I, we need to realize that sin also can, can pervert our hearts. It can also misdirect our hearts and our faith. And of course, the belief that you can download your brain into a computer and live forever is based on a very reductionistic view about what it means to be human. Uh, it's based on the presupposition that it's just the the, the the random interaction of molecules or the electrochemical um, interactions in your brain that make up who you are, uh, that there's nothing more to being human than capturing that. And of course, as Christians, we, we believe that uh, there's also a spiritual reality, that, that uh, humans cannot be just boiled down to the um, random interaction of particles in our brain. That's a very reductionistic view about what it means to be human. And of course, all of these things are a kind of Tower of Babel, a modern Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel story in Genesis um, 11 already depicts people using their own wits, using modern construction techniques, trying to build a bridge, a tower between heaven and earth. And, and instead of looking to Jesus, who, of course, is the, is the real bridge between heaven and earth, um, trying to 
through human autonomy and through human wits and through technology uh, to, to, to build a bridge to heaven on our own. And of course, all those sorts of efforts are, are bound to fail. All right, so we looked at the themes of creation and uh, fall, and of course, redemption. Um, in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ comes. And, uh, and I love these verses uh, from Colossians 1. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I think what's interesting about this passage is that the repeated phrase, all things, literally means all things. You know, God is on a cosmic salvage operation. You know, sin was comprehensive, we, as we mentioned earlier, but Christ's death and resurrection were more than a match for sin. And Jesus is interested in more than just, of course, you know, it's important to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but, but God is looking to redeem his whole creation. Um, I like this quote by Gordon Spikeman. He's a former professor at Calvin College here. Nothing matters but the kingdom, but because of the kingdom, everything matters, every square inch. Uh, belongs to Jesus. And I think the world of technology falls into that as well. God cares about technology. God cares about code. God cares about um, his world, um, all of it. And Christ's redemption and his resurrection and his reconciliation um, are comprehensive. It, it applies to all things. And in 2 Corinthians 5, um, God calls us to be agents of reconciliation, that alongside the reconciling work of Jesus, that we're called to participate in that work. Um, and that's comprehensive. And, uh, and I find that exciting. It means that our technical work matters, that, that God is on this comprehensive uh, redemption uh, effort that's been inaugurated by the death and resurrection of Jesus, and that one day will be completely um, realized. And he calls us to work alongside him as agents of reconciliation. And I think this is where the concept of vocation also comes in. <clears throat> and this is something we talk a lot about in Christian college. So as Christians, we have our primary calling. Now, that's basically to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But we also have secondary callings. And those secondary callings are in our work and in our family and in our neighborhood. and. Uh, and, and, and those secondary callings fall out of our primary callings. They follow from our primary calling. Here's a, a quote from Nancy Piercy. Redemption is not just about being saved from sin. I mean, that, that's a big part of it, to be sure. But it's also about being saved to something, right? We're not only just saved from something, but we're saved to something. To resume the task for which we were originally created, okay? Stephen Garber, uh, he's written books on vocation as well, um, says that vocation is integral, not incidental to the mission of God. Our technical work is a matter of obedience and a matter of witness. Um, I, if I could go back and talk to my younger self sitting in the cubicle farm, I would love to share that with that young man um, to make him realize that his work as an engineer, that your work as computer scientists and engineers matters to God. And that that work is, is a legitimate uh, activity that can flow from your faith, uh, a legitimate activity that can be used to show love for your neighbor, to care for the earth and its creatures, um, to help unfold all the possibilities that God gave us in creation, and to do so in ways that, that honor him. Um, I think vocation and seeing vocation uh, is essential when you're working also in technical fields. All right. In addition, <clears throat> in my book, um, I, I explore certain things I call or that have been called design norms. The, the, these are, I think, helpful guides for thinking about creating responsible technology. Um, these come out of a recognition that creation 
uh, has many different aspects to it that when we're designing a technical product that it's not just um, a bunch of bits or a bunch of um, uh, nuts and bolts but but that there are all kinds of social um, cultural implications on the work that we do <clears throat> and I think as Christians when we're doing technical work we have to zoom out and look at all of these different aspects um, in order to, to to develop thoughtful technology that's responsible and that um, So I'll list some of these things. These are things that, that I think we ought to be thinking about. So the first norm is the norm of stewardship. And this has to do with stewarding money, to be sure, but also the environment, human resources, making sure that there are fair and safe working conditions, thinking about e-waste, sustainability, life cycle analysis, green computing, economics not being absolutized by, uh, like you sometimes see in the comic Dilbert, but you know, profits being made in connection to service to God and neighbor. All right, the second norm here is justice. Justice is a fundamental biblical norm. And I think we have to ensure that our designs respect the rights of all users. I think the book that I mentioned earlier, The Weapons of Mass Destruction, is an example of how algorithms can be used to oppress people. And I think that when we're working with technology, we need to be thinking also about justice, respecting intellectual property, patents, copyrights, fairness, um, trying to reduce the digital divide, attention to privacy and personal information of our customers, um, not creating technologies that you know um, cause injustice, but technologies that encourage further equity and fairness. Um, Another important area is the use of conflict-free minerals, for example. So there's all kinds of justice implications in technology. Caring has to do with the ethics of showing love and care for our neighbor. And that's, that's a fundamental biblical theme as well, loving our neighbor. Loving our coworkers and our customers. Doing things because we ought to, not just because we can. Um, thinking about ways to use technology in assistive ways. Um, Openness and communication is another norm, and that has to do with transparency and clear documentation, truth and advertising and product information, clear protocols, um, technology that's sufficiently understandable. Social norms are another important area. This has to do with courtesy and politeness, um, creating social networking platforms that, that help people to flourish that promote truth. Um, and social norms come into play as well when we're looking at things like social robotics, you know, um, robots for childcare and elder care, is that appropriate? Um, that's another talk, by the way. Uh, aesthetic norms are also important. This is another part of creation. Um, design ought to fit, um, the, the form and function ought to be in harmony. And the aesthetic norms have to do with GUIs and human computer interaction and dashboards and intuitive interfaces. Um, I think Apple computers have done a wonderful job with aesthetics. Um, I think that's one reason why they became so popular. Um, you know, and also with coding. I think anyone who's written code can see beautiful code and not so beautiful code, right? Spaghetti code. Uh, beauty can also be seen in really beautiful circuit layouts and wiring diagrams. The norm of cultural appropriateness has to do with um, a design that fits the culture in which it's introduced to making sure that, that the technology fits, um, that, uh, <clears throat> that it alleviates burdens while preserving what is good. Uh, if you're going to be introducing, for instance, technology into education or worship context, making sure that it fits properly. Um, cultural appropriateness is really important when doing international development and uh, thinking about things like backwards compatibility and continuity versus discontinuity. These are all additional considerations. And finally, the, the, trust, uh, the trust norm, the norm of trust um, has two aspects to it. One, our devices should be reliable and dependable. Um, this is especially important if we're writing code, for instance, in which human health and human lives depend. Uh, but it also has to do with where we put our ultimate trust, making sure that we don't put our ultimate trust in technology, that God becomes the center of our trust. And of course, I, all of these norms are important. They all come into play. Sometimes as a computer scientist, it's easy 
and we're an engineer, it's easy to have blinders and to just look at the nuts and bolts of things and to lose sight of the bigger picture. And I think these norms are, are ways of zooming out and looking at the bigger picture and understanding that te because technology is not neutral, all of these things come into play when we're working with, uh, with new technology. Um, H. H. Farmer once said that if you go against the grain of the universe, you get splinters. And I think these norms, when you ignore them, um, or when you decide to go against them, that there's always consequences. And I think the the Lord has made the world that way. That uh, if we go against his his um, his intents for his creation, that we always encounter um, consequences. And so, uh, so these norms don't always uh, give you a trivial answer to questions that you ask, but they at least can help point the way forward. Um, all right, I'm almost done here. I want to leave some time for questions, but the last biblical theme is the one of restoration, and, and you could do a whole talk on this, but technology in the future. And what's interesting here is that if you look at uh, literature and science fiction, for instance, you often find two common um, sort of sort of um, viewpoints. There's the optimists, the people who trust in technology is the solution. I think the early Star Trek episodes had this sort of optimistic, uh, humanistic sort of theme that through technology and human ingenuity that that uh, we would overcome our problems and and bring peace and and welfare to to the universe. Um, but more recent science fiction films uh, have a much darker sort of tone to it. They, they, they see technology in a very pessimistic light. You know, you think about <clears throat> movies like Terminator and so on. Um, technology is the problem. So the difference between optimists and pessimists is that they, they, they both see technology as sort of central. Technology is either the solution to all our problems or it is the source of all our problems. And of course, um, the biblical story would point to the problem being the, the human heart um, and that, um, uh, that we need to look to God for, um, for, for, our, for, our, for our hope and for our salvation um, and that uh, technology is not, going to, um, is not going to basically change where we're headed. Um, in a sense, um, the Bible paints the story of a new heaven and a new earth. Um, and that's ultimately uh, where we're headed. And what's neat is there, there seems to be technology involved with that. You have, um, <clears throat> the, you know, the beginning of the Bible, beginning with a garden. And then you see at the end, there's this, this city. And there's, there, there's fascinating verses in the Bible too, like Isaiah 60, which talks about, you know, flocks and camel and herds uh, and lumber uh, coming in, the ships of Tarshish, you know, coming into the new heavens and the new earth. Um, you know, the ships of Tarshish were these symbols of pagan commercial power, but somehow they're pictured there in Isaiah, in Isaiah 60. Um, you have Revelations 21 talking about the glory and honor of the nations being brought into uh, the new heavens and the new earth. This verse from Micah 3, 4 verse 3 is really interesting. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. So here we see technology like swords and spears, which are misdirected towards harm and warfare and killing. And we see that they're not annihilated, but rather they're reshaped, they're retooled. Um, they're remade into instruments for cultivation, for looking after the earth, for plowshares and pruning hooks. Um, going back to our original call in Genesis 1 to look after the earth and to, to help it to flourish. Um, you know, sometimes I speculate, you know, um, you know, maybe there will be uh, all kinds of technologies in the new heavens and the new earth. You know, maybe there'll be battleships and predator drones there, but repurposed for looking after creation. Um, and I wouldn't be too surprised to see computers also in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, I've speculated with people from time to time that if there are computers in heaven, um, that they'll be running Linux, but that that's a whole other talk. Um, but yeah, it's it's... We can only speculate, um, truth be told. We, we look as through a, a glass darkly at this point. But I think that we see that technology is part of 
God's good creation, part of the possibilities. And I think that um, when we enter the new heavens and the new earth, we'll have redeemed technology and that will continue to be able to work with technology, which, which is an exciting thought for me. All right, and then finally, there's one important um, topic, and that's the heart. <coughs> this is a quote, again, from Frederick P. Brooks, the computer scientist I quoted from earlier. And this was in a talk he did, which was published in the communications of the ACM. He said, as Jesus said, what comes out depends on the condition of the heart itself. If we would have our creations be true, beautiful, and good, we have to attend to our hearts. And I think this is, this is absolutely true for computer scientists. Uh, what we do comes out of our heart. Uh, we're not just brains on a stick. We're not just thinking things, but we're people who love. And our loves um, are directed in a particular way. Um, we're either motivated by a love for God and neighbor, or our hearts are directed towards something else. And, and we need to attend to those. And the ways that our hearts are shaped is in, in a lot of ways shaped by habits and liturgies. And, and by the way, technology or digital technologies provide powerful habits and liturgies that can shape our hearts in ways that sometimes are not very helpful. Our, our digital technologies have significant formative power. Um, and I think if, if you're interested in, in thinking more about the role of technology in your own life and, and a way of putting technology in its place, um, a good book for that is Andy Crouch's book, uh, The TechWise Family. I found that a very helpful, practical book. And, and I think one way to shape our hearts, to make sure that what comes, comes out of, um, um, that's shaped by our hearts um, is by cultivating different spiritual disciplines and practices. Um, and so, um, so I just wanted to leave you with that. And uh, we don't do that on our own strength, thankfully. Um, God is at work sanctifying his people. And, and I love this quote from uh, Tim Keller in his book, Every Good Endeavor, about how the Holy Spirit can actually help us in our work and in our professions. Uh, here's a quote from Tim Keller. Here's how the Spirit makes us wise. He makes Jesus Christ a living, bright reality, transforming our character, giving us new inner poise, clarity, humility, boldness, contentment, and courage. All this leads to increasing wisdom as the years go by and to better and better professional and personal decisions. Um, we can pray for that. We can pray for the Holy Spirit's help in our work as computer programmers and engineers and to develop the fruits of the Spirit and virtues. That, uh, that will help us to be more wise in terms of how we live out our calling uh, also in the world of technology. And finally, <clears throat> we don't do this on our own. I think it's really important um, to wrestle with some of these things uh, in community as Christians. Um, and I'm grateful for different um, Christian communities of computer scientists and engineers and faith tech, of course, is a perfect example of that, that, that you know, when, when, when we face difficult questions, uh, when we wrestle with ways of building responsible technology and engaging with culture, that we don't do that um, completely on our own, that we have the help of the Holy Spirit, but also of the wider body of the church. Um, pictured here are a few organizations that are, that are encouraging Christians to work and um, come together to, uh, as iron sharpens iron, you know, working together to think about how to live faithfully, our callings also in technology. On the left is the uh, ACMS, which is the Association of Christians in the Mathematical Sciences. It's a group of Christian uh, mathematicians and computer scientists that, that uh, regularly meets. And um, the American Scientific Affiliation is a large organization of Christians in the natural sciences, but they also have a group uh, for engineers and for computer scientists, and they have a, a quarterly uh, journal um, that engages topics of science and faith. The Christian Engineering Society is a group of Christians in engineering that, um, that meet every two years for a conference, and they have um, proceedings and papers that they present on integrating faith and learning. And of course, faith tech is uh, is part of that as well. And so I'm grateful uh, that as a Christian that I 
I do that amid a great cloud of witnesses that I don't have to do that on my own. And, uh, and I'm also grateful for, for organizations like Faith Tech uh, that help us to live that out.